Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vartan Gregorian. I'm president of Carnegie Corporation of New York. On behalf of my colleagues, board of trustees, and others who are not here, I'd like to welcome you. It's my great honor to welcome Carnegie Corporation of New York, Michael Ignatius, the president of Central European University, the former leader of the Liberal Party in Canada, and the former director of Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard. He's a man of conviction, honesty, intellectual integrity, as well as a great leader and educator. And none of these are tax deductible statements. <laughs> I would also like to welcome trustees who are here from Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs, the corporation's sister institution and co-host of tonight's event, as well as Leon Batstein, President of Bard College and Chairman of Central European University. In other words, it's my... Thank you. In other I come in with good intentions. So don't... In addition, it's my great pleasure to welcome, prepared remark, but I'm going to do it. I was told George Soros will be here. I might as well use it in his absence what I was going to say about him. The founder of Central European University, among many other institutions. When I was a student at Stanford University, I read The Open Society and Its Enemies by Karl Popper. I never thought one day I would meet an individual who would put Popper's ideas into practice. However, George Soros is that man. He has never shied away from taking on the opponents to an open society, including in his native Hungary, as well as elsewhere in Europe, Asia, and the United States. Hungary, of course, is home of Central European University. Recent charges against the institution, of which I am sure most everyone here is aware of, are ridiculous, unconvincing, and I thought maybe they belong to Transylvania. As former trustee of Central European University, I can say that I have met many professors, students, and administrators from the institution individuals hailing from the United States, Europe, as many non-Western countries, as well as who, through their work, strive to serve Hungary, Central Europe, Eurasia, and the world. I thought at one time that the uh, Central European University will be Central Euro-Latic uh, peoples and <laughs> claim that Hungary, us, the Central European University, was bringing for the first time individuals, professors, and students from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, all the Central Asian countries. But I guess the president of uh, the Republic of Hungary does not realize that that mission was being uh, implemented by the Central European University. Otherwise, there would have been no problem of internationalizing that university, the first American major university being in, the, in the Central Europe. This being said, Central European University, we are aware, of course, here is great. But tonight we're here to celebrate the man, the leader, and the author. Author of the book, the Ordinary Virtues, Moral Order in the Divided World. I don't know about you, but more than ever, we need to hear moral voices and standards and others. And I don't have to say why. If ever we needed such voices, is today one of them. And uh, with that, it's my pleasure to hand the podium over to my friend and colleague, Joel Rosenthal, President of Carnegie Council of International Affairs. Thank you. Welcome. On behalf of the chairman of our council, Steve Hibbert, and several of our trustees present here this evening, uh, Barbara Corsett, Susan King, Amir Pasek, thank you, Barbara. It's easy to thank you for your generous remarks and for hosting this program. It's harder to find the words for all of the other things you've done for our council, things big and small, seen and unseen, to support our council's mission of making ethics matter. We are a different and vastly more effective organization thanks to you, Barton. 
We continue to draw inspiration from you and your staff here at the corporation and from our Carnegie brothers and sisters around the world. I'm grateful for this opportunity to thank you pub publicly for all of this. Tonight is a noteworthy moment in Carnegie history. It's one in the series of occasions marking 100 years of Carnegie philanthropy. While this event and the publication of Michael's book marked the end of the formal end of our council's centennial celebration, it is really the beginning of the next 100 years, which we begin with great enthusiasm and renewed resolve. When Michael agreed to become our centennial chair, he set an ambitious course. He said we should explore new territory. We should get out of the seminar room, get out of New York, and into the heart of ethical debates around the world. Now, clearing new ground in ethics at the global scale is a monumental task. But this is exactly what Michael has done in his new book. This is exciting in itself, yet for us, what is also exciting are the new areas for research and education that this work suggests. Much of this new direction is suggested in an excellent article by Scott Malcolmson in the Carnegie Reporter magazine. I encourage you to read it, along with Vartan's essay, Against Fragmentation, The Case for Intellectual Wandering. Read both of these articles, and you'll see what I mean. And I'm told that copies of this magazine will be available to you on your way out. For those of you following our council's work, in the coming months and years, you will see new streams of sponsored research along these lines, more opportunities for dialogue and exchange, and more multimedia efforts targeted at schools and the attentive public around the world. Our goal is to show the world why and how ethics matter. I've had the opportunity to introduce Michael as our centennial chairman on several occasions in Edinburgh, Sarajevo, Oxford, and here in New York. It always comes back to the same thing as Varton said, in addition to his comprehensive and deep understanding of history, philosophy, and politics, Michael is engaged in the issues of the day. He is not a passive observer, he is a participant. It is not accidental that Michael is president and rector of Central European University at this moment in time. Michael is not only a scholar, teacher, and writer who has devoted his life to the values embodied by CEU, he has always been a defender of those values. Under Michael's leadership and with the support of George Soros, the founder of CEU, and Leon Botstein, the chair of the CEU board, CEU is a beacon of free thought and expression in a world threatened by increasing authoritarianism. This leadership is exhibited in the CEU curriculum, of course, but also by CEU's role in the community. The recent collaboration between CEU and Bard College's Center for Civic Engagement is a path-breaking example of how colleges and universities can do real and permanent good outside of the so-called ivory tower. I know Jonathan Becker from Bard is here this evening, and I would like to acknowledge him for his leadership in these efforts. Before giving the floor to Michael, I would just like to offer my personal thanks to him for his terrific effort that he put into this project and for the inspiring results it produced. As you will see, this project was multi-year. It required enormous time and energy, lots of travel, and much time away. Thanks are also due to two others whose support was absolutely vital to this effort. First, a heartfelt thank you to Devin Stewart. Devin from Carnegie staff accompanied Michael on his research trips and helped to organize things on the ground. And trust me, these things are always harder than they look. And I'd also like to give an equally heartfelt thank you to Susanna Zohar, who has been supportive of every turn, a great advocate for this work. And as you're going to see in Michael's talk, it's really been a great team effort. So it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Michael Ignatieff, who will discuss his new book, The Ordinary Virtues, Moral Order in a Divided World, published by Harvard University Press.
this is one of these uh, rooms where I could start thanking and acknowledging people, and we'd be here till about nine o'clock. I, I, I look out at friends, colleagues, mentors, people who've uh, uh, helped me narrowly to avoid disaster in various moments of my life, uh, people who've inspired me. Uh, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, I've got some things to tell you. Um, obviously, uh, I, I, I think the whole room has um, deep affection for Vartan Gregorian. Uh, there's something joyous about this guy. Uh, that that would you know, there's something, as we say, life enhancing about him. So thanks for being joyous and life enhancing. Uh, I want to thank Joel Rosenthal who. Uh, didn't laugh me out of the office when he asked me for advice about how to celebrate the centennial of this visionary man's gift, the creation of what became the Carnegie Council. And I said, you got to get out of New York. And I was kind of just playing around. And look what happened three years later. Uh, and many, many thousands of miles we created uh, and completed a rather extraordinary project, which I want to talk to you about. Um, Joel has already mentioned uh, one figure who I really want to emphasize that again, and that's Devin Stewart. Where are you, Devin? There he is. Uh, Devin, Devin accompanied me every mile of the journey, uh, and I just want to publicly acknowledge the incredible um, act of collegiality and friendship in the shaping of a project. So thank you, Devin. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank Everybody at CU, we've got Open Society Foundation global board members. We've got trustees of the university. This is a power-packed room, folks, power-packed. And uh, I hope uh, we also have time for a good discussion. I don't want to uh, uh, prevent you from asking searching questions because a couple of things I say will not be bland and vanilla-like. Some things I'm going to say are going to be uh, possibly hard for some of you to swallow, but that's, that's my job, so let, let's get going. Um, let me just tell you a tiny bit about the Centennial Project. Um, to commemorate this man's visionary foundation of the council in 1914, uh, the council then authorized us to go basically around the world to the United States, to South Central LA, Queens, New York, to Japan, to Fukushima, to Bosnia, to Brazil, to South Africa, to Myanmar, to study what I came to call the moral operating systems of divided societies. And I'll explain what I mean by moral operating systems in a minute. How did we do it? We had two kinds of things. We had global ethical dialogues in which, because the council has global ethics fellows around the world, uh, we asked them to convene smart people in Rio, in Pretoria, in wherever, and have discussions with them about the pressing ethical issues at, at the center of their mind. Example, you go to Rio and you want to talk about corruption and public trust, and I'll take you through that. So we had global ethical dialogues with experts, but very soon both Devin and I began to feel we were still in the seminar room. One of the features of going to the ends of the world is that you discover that everybody has just completed their degree at Columbia. You know, so you, you have a sense that you can never escape a certain kind of conversation. So very rapidly, we wanted to step out of the seminar room, and I'll show you some examples of some of the very strange fascinating places uh, we ended up. And that's what, so we had global ethical dialogues with kind of elite groups. We had site visits, and you'll see some of the site visits that we went to. The result is a book available at all your good bookstores. There's a whole bunch of copies behind, published by Harvard University Press. If there's anybody from Harvard University Press, thank you very much for sticking with this project. Let me try and explain um, uh, what I mean by the ordinary virtues, very briefly. Uh, forgive the PowerPoint, but it, it, it seems the most efficient way to do, some, to do some work with you. By ordinary virtues, I simply mean the virtues of ordinary life 
And by ordinary people, I mean you. I don't mean some other group of people who are not in this room. I mean the ordinary reasoning, the ordinary display of moral behavior that all of us display. Uh, and the, the virtues that I'm looking at were, in a sense, the, the positive ones, pity, compassion, tolerance, friendliness, <coughs> forgiveness. Um, I'm interested in those virtues that make for moral order, that keep the show on the road, the microscopic interchanges between human beings that make for a moral world as opposed to a jungle. And everywhere, in every social setting, people are knitting together what I would call the moral operating system of their particular world. Um, a, a, and by operating system, I mean it's a metaphor to computers and stuff. All I mean by that is when you turn the, when you turn the thing on, you forget about it. It's a sense of the tacit, the unstated, the implicit. That's what I'm trying to capture by the idea of a moral uh, operating system. But these virtues, and here we set up the question that I was interested in, these virtues are very local. They're the virtues of a community. They're the virtues of, a, 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 of small settings. And the question that we went around the world looking at was the relationship between the universal values, let me pick one, human rights, and these local virtues. It is commonly assumed that, that the ordinary virtues are the source of human rights universalism. That it's some basic intuition we have about human beings that allows and structures and undergirds uh, the idea of the universal virtues, uh, universal values, like human rights. I was struck on the, on the other hand by something very different, which is that the ordinary virtues and universal values are in much more tension than we like to admit. And a lot of the inquiry that we went over three years was looking at that tension in action. And I'll give you some examples of what I mean. So the kind of questions that organized this study were, what keeps a liberal democracy together? We have an institutional bias when we think about open societies or liberal democracies. We put an emphasis on rule of law. We put, on, we put a, an emphasis on the Madisonian machinery um, that keeps this thing together. And we don't focus on the micro-sociology of virtuous behavior. And the, the operating systems reproduced in society that make these societies cohere. And I was interested in what happens when these operating systems are put under pressure. What happens in fragmented, in divided societies? Uh, what happens when the moral operating systems and the local virtues are put under uh, pressure? I was also interested, since these are private virtues and local virtues, what happens when political discourse starts to work on them? What happens when a, a Trump, a Viktor Orban, goes to work on people's emotional feelings? How does that impact the operation of the ordinary virtues? And then this question that I've already suggested, how do we handle the conflict between local virtues and universal values? the universal values of human rights, duties to refugees and strangers versus the local virtues, which are pride in your nation, pride in your community, preference for us versus preference uh, for them. Now, let me give you very briefly a sense of where we went. That's kind of the intellectual menu, but let me tell you where we went so you see where we traveled. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. We, went to, we first went to Rio, in June 2013. We had one of those global ethical dialogues with experts. It was kind of hilarious in retrospect because we got them around the table. I'd make, I don't mean to satirize them. They're very wise and able people. And we talked about corruption. And they all said, well, there is a culture of corruption in Brazil, but there's nothing you can do about it because basically the Brazilian public basically accepts that everybody's on the take. So the 
the political culture of corruption is undergirded by a public culture of acceptance. Well, that was fine. We listened to that. And then I began to look out the window. And out the window, first there was about 10 people carrying Brazilian flags, and then there were 100, and then, were, then there were 1,000, and then there were 10,000 people in the street. And so I said, what's going on, folks? We better get out there and take a look. That was the beginning of the million-person demonstrations against corruption in Brazil. So the experts told you one thing, and the people were telling you another. I am, I am a dyed-in-the-wool, convinced and proud intellectual. I will not traffic in anti-intellectual populism of any kind. But let's be frank, sometimes the experts get these things wrong. Here is a dramatic example of where we followed those demonstrations for three or four days and began to set, get a sense of the visceral fury of the Brazilian public about the corruption issue that the experts hadn't uh, seen. It was visceral fury that also ended in uh, very strong amounts of uh, violence that smashed uh, cash machines. Um, we then um, uh, looked at the relationship between uh, corruption and moral order. When you ask yourself, why are these people in the street? Corruption, I think, affected Brazilian citizens as humiliation. The connection between corruption and humiliation is not well understood. Over and over and over, people said to me, how stupid do they think we are? Right? They're stealing and we, they think we don't care. That's what I mean by uh, corruption as humiliation. Let me also show you another place we went, because we went away from the experts to a wonderful place called Favela Santa Marta. Favela Santa Marta is a thriving, extremely poor community perched on the hillside of uh, Rio de Janeiro. It has been beset by drug gangs. It has been beset by violence. But it has been the source of a very important experiment in policing, in which the police basically reconquered the favela uh, over a period of a couple of years and reestablished order. Why was this interesting to us? Because it allowed us to see the relationship between the rule of law and the moral operating systems of poor societies. It became very clear looking in Santa Marta that if you can have minimally fair policing, i.e. policing where they don't shoot you because of their, your race, and they kind of try and arrest somebody when a crime is committed, minimal standards of rule of law, moral order can rebuild in a place like the favela, and we saw it being rebuilt all around us. What am I looking at? I'm looking at mothers leaving their kids with a neighbor. I'm looking at uh, people looking after their, uh, their elderly relatives. I'm looking at churches beginning to function. The molecular creation order in extremely poor communities, but absolutely dependent on the rule of law, dependent on uh, uh, the police, and we saw that uh, going on. Let me tell you the same theme. The same theme occurred in uh, South Central LA. The very uh, ferocious looking guy in black asses is actually pretty ferocious, an ex gang leader in South Central LA, who, having done about 15 years in the tank in various prisons, decided to turn his life around and begin to turn the next generation away from crime. One of the ways to think about him in terms of the moral operating system of South Central LA is that he's writing code for the moral operating system of that community, trying to get young people to turn their lives around. Trying, he's, a, he's a moral agent in, in these settings. And we talked to him again about the tremendous importance of having rule of law institutions that uh, support and sustain his kind of efforts. In a way, LA is a place in which you see the repair of a broken moral operating system following the Los Angeles riots of 1991. The LAPD cleans up its act, the community gets to work, and you see a moral operating system being put back into place. Um, let me, 
We also went to Jackson Heights, Queens, again, to look at another feature of the moral operating systems of these societies. How is it that Jackson Heights, Queens is the most diverse census tract in the United States. It's a bus station. It has 180, 190 ethnic groups living side by side in relative peace and harmony. It seems to me actually mysterious, wonderful, and extremely positive that this community coheres. What is the moral operating system that allows people who do not share the same language, the same religion, the same politics, the same views, to live side by side? How does this diversity work as a moral system? This was the question we asked in Jackson Heights, uh, Queens. We then went to Bosnia because we wanted to look. This is a man, a Bosniak, standing in front of a uh, Muslim burial ground that contains 276 bodies of the Muslims who were massacred in a single day in his village. And he buried them all and put the monuments up himself. And here's the, here's the question. He lives beside Serbs. He lives beside the perpetrators 25 years later. How is it that Forgiveness works in these micro settings. How is it that he manages to live among perpetrators and recreate a form of moral order between victims and perpetrators? He said something fascinating to me. He said, I've learned not to generalize. That is, there is no such thing as a guilty Serb in general. There are some Serbs I can't stand, I can't forgive, I can't forget, but he, he was okay. The logic of ordinary virtue is extreme individualization. I don't generalize. I take people one at a time. I take people as they come. I began to learn the moral wisdom of this studied refusal to generalize as being a key to the reproduction of moral order in these conflicted uh, settings. Here's another place. We go to South Africa. These, this is a, a community called Zama Zama outside of Pretoria, South Africa, where you're looking at another thing. How do you produce moral order in the total absence of the state? In Zama Zama, there are no cops. There is no welfare system. There is no sanitation. There is no water. The government of South Africa might as well be on Mars, and yet it's a half an hour from the capital of the country. How is it that communities entirely abandoned by the liberal state, the state that wrote the world's best liberal constitution, the 1994 constitution, how does moral order cohere in a society that has been abandoned by the Mandela state, the ANC state? Again, we saw the same molecular complex process in which people create forms of moral order because these folks know one thing. It's very bad to be poor, but it is much worse to be in a place torn apart by violence. What was interesting to watch here is this is a naturally Hobbesian situation that didn't turn Hobbesian, right? This is how, this is a moral operating system working in extremis. Um, here were some of the people that, now I'm going to get to the end of my, my, my tour, I, but I want to take you to another. Each of these features is chapters in the book. You'll see me uh, not smiling. I'm not happy. I'm not happy because I'm talking to an extremist Buddhist monk who makes a very good living preaching hatred towards uh, Islam, Muslims, and the Rohingya. Uh, and that raised another issue which is, it seems to me, central to understanding moral order, which is 
the role of political discourse in confiscating emotion. Think about this. He's a man who gets up in small communities, for example, Mandalay in, in Myanmar, a beautiful place, and he spreads a message of hatred towards Muslims. There are a lot of Muslims in Mandalay, as it happens. They've been there for centuries. They're, they're commercial traders. They live in harmony with their Buddhist majority neighbors. He spreads a kind of poison which confiscates the possibility of tolerance, confiscates the possibility of saying, well, you know, some Muslims are okay folks. That individual particularized moral reflex. These political discourses confiscate that, remove the space in which someone can say, well, actually, that Muslim guy is my neighbor, right? So that's an example of which there are plenty of examples around the world in which political discourse has a huge role in shaping the possibilities of a moral operating system. It can confiscate the expression of virtue. It can also empower the expression of virtue. There are political cultures, for example, which make it fashionable, acceptable, and a nice thing to be generous towards refugees, towards generous towards strangers. Uh, as you know, Canada is a perfect country. Um, it is a faultless place. It is paradise on earth politically. But that would be an example of a country in which a political culture empowers a moral emotion. In this case, generosity towards uh, strangers. Finally, um, I wanted to look at moral order in situations of utter devastation. A Force 9 um, uh, tsunami, a devastating nuclear release, a community thrown back to a, it's as if the society is destroyed in one moment, in one 30 to 40 minute period. Um, uh, 30,000 people drown, communities are devastated through northeastern Japan. And my question was, how does moral order get reestablished in, in situations of devastation and catastrophe? And one of the ordinary virtues I'm most interested in, and we all should be interested in, is resilience. What is resilience? How do people show resilience in the face of, of catastrophe? The place in the world that can teach you most about religion, uh, resilience are the small, devastated towns of the Fukushima prefecture, where Devin and I spent a lot of time together. And there, you saw another thing about the moral operating systems of these societies. They're deeply historical. If you asked a guy who just lost everything why he had the faith and confidence to rebuild, they said one of two things. They said, my family has been here for 400 years. Do you think a tsunami is going to get us out of here? A recourse a, 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 to historical strength to get you through. Secondly, a recourse to things that we usually dismiss as a kind of TV joke, the samurai tradition. We may think samurai is just something you see on the TV, but for these folks, this was real. Men thought of themselves as samurai. It's very gender-coded, of course, but it gave them the resilience to survive the unimaginable and unthinkable. So uh, there we are. That was the tour. These are the issues we raised. And I want, to, I want to get now to some conclusions and take you into some controversial terrain. What do you learn when you go to six places like this and you look at, as you can see, very different themes? But are there overarching themes that come together? One of the things that I don't think we think about enough is the enormous moral impact of living in a post-imperial world, a world in which the empires have been dismantled. Somebody who looks like me and talks like me, especially if I was British, had I been an adult in 1945, a tacit, unstated assumption of my moral universe was that I was born to rule. Ask a Frenchman the same. Ask a Dutch person the same. 
the sense of unavowed but deep moral superiority that came with imperial power. We need to understand decolonization and, and the, the, the dismantling of empire as having an enormous moral impact in two ways. That is, it delegitimizes the master races. And this is both an international phenomenon, but it's also a domestic phenomenon. You can't separate the American Civil Rights Revolution from the international decolonization revolution. They're both going on at the same time. They're both powered by the same emotions. And they're both an attempt to create a post-imperial moral universe credit based upon the idea of the moral equality of all individuals. And so this global norm of an equality of voice has, as I'm trying to say in the slide, three dimensions. There's the self-determination revolution. There's the democratic revolution. We remember, you know, Eastern Europe and the world has adopted the democratic norm. Don't forget that even in China and Russia, the norm is the ideal of popular sovereignty as the basis of political legitimacy. We don't see how far this idea of uh, moral equality has is, is run. The rights revolution has empowered this as a language of individual empowerment, and that includes the, the, the civil rights revolution, the feminist revolution, the, gay, the uh, revolution in gay equality. We just are in a different moral universe than we were in 1945. And how does this translate when you're out on the road? It translates in something that takes you a while to realize. You sit down with the poorest people, and they all look you in the eye. Nobody lowers their gaze. Nobody thinks it's odd that someone has come from far away to ask them moral questions about the meaning of their lives. They take it for granted that they have something they want to say. And they take it for granted that I am there to hear and listen. In 1945, I just don't think the dialogues that we had, the site visits we had, would have been conceivable. The conversation wouldn't have occurred. There would have been silence on the other side. And that seems to me a revolutionary aspect of the modern world, which in the middle of all the bad news we've got, is a, is a very important thing we need to, to think about. And its implications are ambiguous. The more, the more the moral claim of equality makes its way in the world, the more impatient everybody is with the deep inequalities that remain. There's a dialectic of insatiability here. I'm not claiming we're all equal. I'm not claiming, I'm not claiming the inequalities are less flagrant than before. I'm saying there may be more flagrant than before. But the starting assumption of everybody is I matter. I matter. You know, you go to the poorest communities, they say they can't treat me like garbage. This is a revolution in moral feeling we need to understand. But it comes with a, a, um, a complication that I think we need to think about, which is that you would think that a global norm of equality undergirded, for example, and expressed by the language of human rights, you'd think that this would produce more human solidarity across groups. The, the, this, almost the central paradox of our work was to feel, on the one hand, people are saying, you can't treat me like garbage. I'm as good as anybody else. I'm equal. On the other hand, the frame of reference for their moral lives was intensely local and has got even more local. Moral globalization has not, has not produced more moral solidarity across ethnic groups, across races, across religions. So you have the paradox of equality without solidarity. That we saw everywhere. Uh, if you ask people in Zama Zama, you know, who do you care about? They care about Zama Zama. You ask in the favela Santa Marta who you care about, they say, I matter, I can't be treated like a piece of garbage, but their solidarity is extremely tightly bounded by the favela, not, not beyond it, okay? So this is, a, this is a, a, a paradox of our time that needs to be thought about, and it leads to some, some very difficult questions about human rights universalism. 
Because if, you know, I've taught human rights for a decade. I'm, a, I'm signed up. But in, in, a, in a proper doctrine of human rights universalism, you know, there is no other. There's only us. Um, uh, the otherness is constructed. It's not real. Um, and otherness is morally irrelevant in, in determining moral duties. And so the duties of common humanity trump any local allegiance and local belief. And that means that asylum and protection claims for strangers trump, when it comes to it, uh, the claims and rights of citizens. Now, the point I'm trying to get to here is the ordinary virtues perspective sees the world in very, very different ways. And we have to face up to that. Um, for all the people that I talk to, the primary distinction is self, other, us, them, citizen, stranger. I'm not essentializing that. I'm just saying that's what I saw, right? There is no idea, or the idea of a common humanity comes very, very late to the story. The primary duties are local. Um, and this means that race, religion, gender, nationality, all the markers of difference that human rights universalism regards as um, constructed, uh, something that we can get beyond and get over, um, doesn't sound right uh, from the ordinary virtues uh, perspective. Um, difference is primary. Common humanity is conditional, by which I mean you discover that someone who is very different from you is actually a member of the, the same human race. You begin to negotiate commonality. You don't start from commonality. You establish it as you establish real relations. You meet a Muslim. You meet a Jew. You meet a black person. You meet a white person. You meet a gay person. And from that encounter with difference, you begin to construct a narrative of commonality that it's very fragile and very vulnerable and easily broken by the claims of, of, uh, of uh, the primary claims uh, of the ordinary virtues. And so if you look at, and here I want to make a, a contrast between gifts and rights. If you ask, if you go to anywhere that is multicultural and diverse, or you go to any frontier between a citizen and a stranger, this is a transaction, it seems to me, in which a citizen says, if I'm going to tolerate somebody, it's a gift. Tolerance is a gift. It's not an obligation. Tolerance is conditional. Tolerance is something I give to someone. It's not an obligation that follows from their rights. And, and this is a very strange, it, it illuminates the contrast between a human rights perspective and an ordinary uh, virtue uh, perspective. And if a stranger comes to the gate and says, I have a right to be admitted. I have a right to your toleration. I have a right to your compassion. I have a right to your generosity. And a citizen thinks, wait a minute, you don't understand this transaction. This is a gift transaction, not a rights transaction. And I don't think human rights, and I'm a human rights guy, have thought enough about the radical contrast between the language of the gift and the language of rights. And that's one of the things that is highlighted by the contrast between the ordinary virtue perspective and the human rights uh, perspective. And so to get to a burning contemporary issue, um, when you look at uh, the dialogue on refugee and asylum rights in Europe, you've got people who believe in asylum policies in the 1951 convention, in the obligations of states, talking a rights language which simply hits a wall of incomprehension from citizens. Because they start from a different premise. There are citizens and there are strangers. Strangers come to your door, and citizens decide who gets the gift. 
Asylum is a gift, it's not a right. Shelter is a gift, it's not a right. The transaction is a transaction of compassion and generosity, not the acknowledgement of reciprocal obligation. I'm trying to describe the sociology, the political sociology we're dealing with in Europe and many other places. If you ask why the Trump attack on migration and refugee policy strikes a chord, it's because he's saying, we're the gift givers. We'll decide. It's discretionary. Citizens come first. Strangers come second. It's a discourse right across the developed world. How do you understand the German election last night? The language of the gift is battling with the language of rights. And frankly, the language of the gift is winning. And I'm not saying it to praise the language of the gift. I'm trying to describe the politics of what we're looking at. Um, now, I don't want to essentialize the ordinary virtues. I don't want to say they're incorrigible. I want to say, in fact, something very different, which is this language of generosity, compassion, and mercy, which is crucial to sustain if we're to have asylum and refugee policies that um, are something better than barbarism. We want to sustain those languages, but we are, we are faced with a battle in which populist rhetoric, Viktor Orban would be one example, alternative for Deutschland is another, and I can go around the board, Donald Trump is another in which we have to understand what's going on is that this is political discourse that confiscates the virtues, that simply says it is disreputable and it limits a betrayal of your country to show generosity and compassion to a stranger. And it, this language is reworking the political emotions upon which a migration and refugee policy depends. And liberals like me who want generous refugee policy. Hey, it's my trade union, my father and my grandfather refugees, right? What, what, what else can I think here? Have watched the collapse of any political support for refugee and migration policies simply because we don't understand the deep degree to which our fellow citizens regard the language we use, the language of the right, as mistaking what's actually going on. It's a gift transaction. So, what do we do about that? How do we do this? Um, I think we have to start changing the political language we're using. And that means we have to, in my view, strengthen the ordinary virtues. The ordinary virtues here are the, the language of compassion, generosity, and mercy. But you can't do it unless you understand the ways in which citizens see a primary distinction between a citizen and a stranger and view the, the acceptance of a stranger into a society as a contract in which we say yes to you on condition that you say yes to us, right? In a gift transaction, you're grateful for the gift. You say thank you, right? This doesn't fit at all with the language of human rights, where we simply acknowledge a right and accept an obligation. In the integration compact that ordinary virtue understands, we'll say yes to you if you say yes to us. And then we want to do something else, which is fight back against a political language which is confiscating the language of generosity, compassion, and mercy with a language that, that tries to get to the inside of ordinary virtue, which is take people as they come, take people one at a time, refuse false aggregation, refuse Muslims, refuse Jews, refuse blacks, refuse whites, refuse gays, refuse all of it, refuse those kind of universalizing languages wherever we can to focus on the individual in front of us um, and, and reconnect uh, ordinary virtue uh, to, to individuals. Uh, empower the ordinary virtues with a language of generosity. Again, as you know, Canada is a perfect country. But if you ask why it is that the Canadian refugee policy has been successful, it's because it hasn't used the language of rights. It's actually said we're a generous country. 
We're a compassionate country. This is about compassion. This is about us, right? I'm not saying I like all this language, but I'm saying you've got to understand what is the moral resonance of language like this if we're going to turn this around. Let me, let me come to a conclusion. I've gone a little longer than I intended, but uh, I'm going to conclude, and I promise, four minutes. Um, I've said on the one hand that this journey we took was kind of a study in post-imperial moral culture. It was a study of the moral operating systems of a 21st century world. And it's a post-imperial moral world. It's a world in which, based on basic equality of voice, but not enhanced or deepened human solidarity. That's the paradox uh, we saw first. And there is an increasing conflict between human rights universalism and the political language that has caught the ordinary virtues, which is the language of democratic sovereignty, the language that privileges the citizen over the stranger, the, the language that says we must decide who gets the gift, right? That's the enormous appeal of these nationalist languages, because at the bottom of this is not visceral, irrational nationalism, but a powerful appeal to democratic sovereignty. If we're going to give gifts, we, the people, will decide who gets the gift. That's the logic here. Um, and we need to understand this language, not approve it, not endorse it, but understand what we're dealing with. Um, the populist resurgence is deeply anti-universalist. We need to fight back with an insistence on the crucial importance of counter-majoritarian rights talk in domestic constitutions. What has been the most effective opposition to Trump? It's been the lawsuits in the American constitutional process. Please don't hear me saying I want to jet jettison rights talk or counter-majoritarian protections. I'm just saying the political battle will not be won with rights talk alone. Um, I'm saying a progressive response cast in the language of counter-majoritarian rights, I think, will lose. But a progressive response cast in the language of democratic sovereignty and a defense of the ordinary virtues of generosity, compassion, and mercy, I think, can uh, turn the tide. Thank you for your attention. Sorry to go on a little longer than I intended. Uh, I am happy to take uh, questions, and since I've said some things with which you may disagree, I hope you'll be as disobliging as possible. And, um, yeah. And then there's a question here and a question there. Yeah. Thank you. Do any parties that you have run for prime minister believe in the Constitution? Um, well, I ran for office in a country that, again, so much of this depends on the collective identity. Um, a country that has self-described itself as an immigrant nation, a country that has self-described itself as a generous country, often in invidious and self-congratulatory ways, i.e. we're more generous than those Yankees to the South. I mean, I, I don't want to endorse all this or not be... I, I don't want to miss irony about this. Some self-descriptions that a country has are as phony as anybody else's, and Canada is no exception. But the, the politics that I, that I was part of was able to tap into a kind of reservoir here that was very easy to draw on. And my concern is the reservoir is drying up. It's drying up everywhere. And it, it may have dried up in Germany last night. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm astonished at what's happening in the United States because you have one of the most generous and far-sighted refugee uh, policies in the world. You've led the world in this. And yet somehow there's a kind of way in which that generosity has been confiscated. That's what I mean. It's not that it's disappeared. It's not that it isn't there. It's been confiscated. You look like a sap if you say we ought to take some Syrian refugees. You look like a, you can look like an unpatriotic American if you say we ought to we ought to open our doors to strangers. And that, that move is something we have to 
It seems to me we, we've got to understand and then, and then do something about it. Peter? supposed to do something? I think it's on. It just speaks? Okay. <coughs> Hi. Um, Michael, you make a really persuasive case for the importance of the post-imperial order. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure you're taking it far enough mm -hmm. um, because where I think I disagree with you is I don't have a problem about talking about the relationship between citizens and non-citizens in the terms of the, the ordinary virtues yeah. that you're speaking about. But within the nation state, I think one of the most important things about the post-imperial order is exactly the recreation of, the, of nation states. So that within India, for instance, I will not as a woman, speak or demand anything in the language of the ordinary virtue. I will only demand it as a citizen. And that uh -huh. distinction, therefore... And why is that, Gita? Because you've been, you've been actively disempowered or you think it's not the right thing to do or what? And as no, it because the most important thing of the... Um, uh, uh, of the post-imperial order is that I am a citizen. Yes. And because I am a citizen, I will not ask for the fulfillment of rights yes. in any language but that. Yes. Um, but we're very busy throwing the Rohingya out of India and there's very little counter yes. Um, yes. response to that. It's almost like, well, you know, yes. they're not us. And so I can see this, but I think it's um, there's a distinction that's really important. Yes, and there's no question that the language of citizenship has been the key moral language of a post-imperial order. And what self-determination has given people is the sense that they can speak as citizens. I mean, that I I I, I absolutely see. But I'm saying your Rohingya example is good. That language is not is not empowering you to or, or and doesn't create constituencies to defend uh, vulnerable populations. Um, yeah. Um, yes, Jean Marie. Sorry. Thank you. No, I, I want to challenge you a bit on the, on what I understand is your analysis that the individual to individual, mm -hmm. the ordinary yeah. <coughs> virtues, you can build a political order on them yeah. through democratic mm -hmm. sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And indeed, in terms of human rights, it is true that the notion that we would have the same fellow feelings for people who are a thousand miles away from us as from people who are a hundred miles away, it's an abstraction. It's not yeah. true. Yeah. And it's not, it doesn't correspond to the reality of humanity. But I wonder, of course, I'm a Frenchman, so you always bring back things to, <laughs> bring things back to uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder whether after the end of the Cold War, there has not been a bit too much of a focus, and I wonder whether you are a prisoner of that, a bit too much of a focus on individual agency. And that in reality, human communities, they also believe in collective agency. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that follows on uh, what you said oh. about, about India and about uh, the response to empires. Mm -hmm. uh, was decolonization the empowerment of individuals mm -hmm. or the empowerment of nations? And then, if it is the empowerment of nations, of collective groups, then we have all the questions on what is a community today in a world that is mm -hmm. uh, torn apart by transnational identities, by a variety of forces. 
that have destroyed the self-evidence of a human community. And so democratic sovereignty begs the question of what is the framework in which that democracy uh, works. So my, uh, my challenge to you would be, yes, you cannot ignore ordinary virtues and the pretense of human rights that you can build a sort of universal community that doesn't correspond, does not correspond to the human experience. Mm -hmm. But nor does a human experience be based on anything, on, on the ignorance of that collective dimension between the universal mm -hmm. and the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean-Marie, th that's a strong, uh, a strong point. M my individualism point was actually more narrow than I think you're taking it. Um, I was just enormously impressed that when I saw, uh, I saw a struggle going on at, uh, at the ground level, w which I think we all experience, between the, the constant production of collective images of the other, the Muslim, the Jew, the gay, the black, the white, whatever, the constant reproduction of those discourses, some of them are re reflected in those communities themselves, and we misuse community all the time. And I, what I see is an estimable moral struggle when I see it engaged for people to say, I am not going to buy these collective identities. I'm going to look at the person in front of me. And, you know, my mother said uh, a wise thing to me, and got to listen to your mom, right? She said her idea of heaven was a place where all dislike was purely individual. It's a brilliant remark, actually. You know, it's, it's you. You know, it's not that you're a Frenchman or a man or a person of a certain age. It's you that I don't like, right? <laughs> or, or like a lot. Do you know what I mean? And that struggle... I, I, Mais apologies, Jean-Marie, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you see, that's the point I was making about there's something very good to be said about moral individualism at this, at this point. Um, and, and that was the only point I was, I was trying to make. And, and the thing I would go on to say is that, you know, there's a lot of loose talk about globalization, but everything I saw was reinforcing the enormous attachment of local community, national identities, racial identities, linguistic identities. Um, I don't know how we bought an idea that we were all heading in one direction uh, and we were all um, uh, going to be uh, morally globalized as well as economically globalized. Nothing of the kind has happened. Uh, all the local national rooted identities are stronger than they were in my view 25 years. They're all changing, but they're not disappearing anytime soon, which to me seems like a very, actually a good thing. Michael, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think you showed the picture of the Buddhist monks, mm -hmm. and that raises the issue for me. You don't deal with diasporas. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived through uh, Soviet Jewry coming. Mm -hmm. They did not feel, many New Yorkers and Chicago adopted, that their fellow Jews, no matter what language they spoke, they would not be welcome as an act of solidarity. Mm -hmm. The group solidarity, diaspora solidarity. The same thing about Lebanese in uh, uh, Chi Michigan. Mm -hmm. The same thing, Iranians in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how that figures. The same mm -hmm. thing, Irish, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, no matter where you are Irish, you're always part of the community separated from. Uh, I, I don't think you deal with that issue. And I don't know whether there's any validity or not. But I found that uh, all the arguments you made disappears when a Jew and Lebanese and Iranian mm -hmm. and others is going to rejoin their local community in which generosity and right yes. or opportunity coincide. Would you comment on yes. that, please? Well, you know, as someone who, whose father and grandmother grew up in a Russian community in Montreal, I know a little bit about diasporas. And what you're saying is that that's a form of transnational solidarity which is stubbornly enduring the only thing i'd say about it is that from a human rights purist point of view it's always regarded as a certain kind of suspect partiality 
That is to say, Jews looking after Jews, Liberians, Liberians looking after Liberians, Russians looking after Russians, that's somehow regarded as a slightly imperfect form of solidarity. My view is, hell, I'll take anything I can get here. And, and diaspora solidarity seems to me extremely important. Now, let's be honest, there's an extremely negative side to it as well. I mean, in, in the Yugoslav catastrophe, some of the most extreme and transigent inciting forces driving the dynamic in Yugoslavia off the cliff were diaspora communities urging their people on. So let's emphasize the positive solidarity, which you're emphasizing, but let's also not forget some of the negative sides as well. Oh, boy. Uh, there, there, there's a back row. The, the lady in the back row, yeah, had her hand. Good evening. Thank you. I'm a CU alumna, so I'm, I'm a CU alumna, so I'm very pleased to to be today here and to listen to your presentation. So my question is related to neoliberalism and um, distribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, what role plays the distribution of wealth in constructing this Im image of us versus them? And if you identify also a class identity among a gender, race, yeah. and if people divide themselves also along class issue yeah. and economic, social economic issues, not just identity politics. So if you can ev yeah. elaborate a bit yeah. on that. I, um, I was struck in uh, Favela Santa Marta and also in Zama Zama, South Africa, um, Yes, an identity of being poor, but that's not a class identity. They all wanted to get the hell out. It, it didn't bring them together. You know, we're poor, but we're proud, uh, and our, our identity is formed by that. It was a negative identity that they wanted to uh, escape. But let me turn your question around a little bit and refocus it, not because you didn't ask it precisely, but I wanted to go slightly different direction. One of the really interesting moral questions that we don't look at is how extremely unequal societies in terms of income distribution, class divisions of the kind that you're evoking, don't produce explosions. And, and how do they cohere? Given that everybody knows the deck is kind of stacked in a way, and yet they reproduce over time. And when is it that they actually explode? That's what makes Los Angeles so fascinating to me. When did Los Angeles blow up? It wasn't because, you know, some people are driving around in Maseratis and some people are in some old Ford Pinto. It wasn't because some people are working, you know, $12 an hour jobs if they're lucky and other people are making, you know, $1,000 a second. The reason it blew up is that they beat a black guy up on camera. And, and the rupture of the moral order there that's where it occurred. Because the box says the 14th Amendment. That's what the box says, right? And they get told it every day. That's what is supposed to happen, right? And then you get whacked on the head with a nightstick because you're black, right? And badly beaten. And somebody videos it. And then the place really goes. And that seems to me tells you something fundamental about the moral order of our societies. In other words, you can put up with a hell of a lot of social inequality, economic inequality, stacked decks. But if the cops start beating you up because of your race, all bets are off. It's a recurrent pattern, 1965 in Watts, 1991. In, and, it, and it brought home to me as a, you know old paid up liberal that we don't think enough about policing as the core of a liberal order, and decent policing as a core of a liberal order. Um, but it redoubles the perplexity, because we live in very unequal societies. Everybody in this room is very privileged, and we're proud of our achievements and accomplishments, but we're aware that it's tough out there. But the, the show goes on. So my question is, uh, why does this show go on? And what is the moment when the show doesn't go on anymore? Right? And the, the, 
the observational sociology tells you, look at Los Angeles. That tells you a lot about that question. University. Uh, as I was reading your book, uh, former president. Oh Obama my God! I think you're the first person who's actually read this book. That's amazing. <laughs> so as I was reading it, uh, the former president Obama uh, sent out a tweet that said, "I'm paraphrasing, uh, but it's pretty close, uh, that no child is born hating anybody." No. And it turned out to be, I think, the most uh, widely read and quoted tweet. And I wonder. Uh, perspective of what you've learned in your book, how do you account for the enormous popularity of that tweet? Mm. Well, I, I, I see to no one in my admiration of the former president. I, I think the tweet was picked up because he said what people deeply want to believe, number one. And number two, there's a lot of observational evidence to show that he's actually right, that we come out into the world not thinking difference is primary. Um, but I'm saying we start thinking difference is primary pretty quickly. And that's a very, very complicated sociological, psychological, and historical story. But he, he put that tweet out at a moment when um, uh, the beasts have been let loose. And he wanted to remind us it doesn't have to be that way. And we passionately want to believe that to be true. Uh, I don't know what to do here. Yes, sir. There, I'm afraid that I'm, I'm. I think I said the line. But uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a veteran. And uh, when, I, when I came back from, uh, from war, uh, I think there were two times in my life when I really felt kind of a deep feeling of universal connection with everybody else yep. and one of them was after the birth of my first son mm -hmm. uh, and one of them was when I came back from war mm -hmm. and and I think that part of the reason for that was the experience of comradeship in the Marine Corps mm -hmm. in my case and in the case of some other veterans was capable of being universalized mm -hmm. making that leap mm -hmm. from feeling very strongly about a group of other people mm -hmm. and then feeling very strong, feeling somewhat of the same feelings about, about everybody. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish I could say it lasted, but um, it, uh, no, it, 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 it yeah. still, it, it, it has stuck with me, but it was, a, it was a very strong feeling there, there for a while and I try to, uh, so why are some forms of limited solidarity why do they stay insular? Because, of course, some of my fellow yep. veterans don't feel this way at all. Uh, and others uh, seem to be capable of uh, spreading themselves out in this, in this way. No. Thanks. That's a really uh, wonderful uh, question, and it challenges my dichotomy between kind of local attachments and universal ones. And you're saying in fact, that the little platoon, literally, you know, Burke's famous phrase, the little platoon can generate universal feelings of, of attachment and commitment. Because you see, uh, you know, when the Marine Corps works and when you're under fire and under enormous pressure, you see human beings do things that are unforgettable. You know, they're just unforgettable. Your life literally depends on it. Uh, and that can give you a feeling of expanded human possibility. But you did say it didn't last. I mean, you did say that it kind of, it kind of fades. Um, I don't think that means that it's false. I just think it means life is very complicated. And the moments of exaltation that you have when you sacrifice together and struggle together and pull together um, in adversity and combat in those situations are not ordinary life. They're they're very particular moments, and you can't, um, there's another side, I mean, you'd have much more experience about this than I would, but there, there are people who experience the exaltation of unity in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a combat situation, 
and come back to ordinary life and it's just so damn disappointing. It's so selfish. It's so divided. It's so, and they think, I saw what human beings can do when they pull together and, and look at this. We're, we're fussing and fighting and exactly. Um, so, but you're challenging my assumption that there's a kind of necessary antagonism between the local and the universal. And I, I just, all I can record is I'm, I'm listening hard to what you're saying. I need to think more about it. But it, it's a, a fascinating uh, question. Um, I don't know what to do here. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I better go there. Yes, yeah, the lady in the glasses, I'm sorry. And then maybe a couple more, and then I should. Five minutes, yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm so glad you're focusing on the, this, you know, ordinary virtues, this last slide, and uh, defending generosity and hospitality. Um, Donald Trump told a story repeatedly during his campaign about the snake, about a woman who took in an ailing snake, yep. an ailing creature, and then the snake bit her, and when she protested at this, you know, misuse of her generosity, the snake said, you knew I was a snake all the time. Why did you take me in? So it's not only you're being punished for being compassionate, but you're a dupe, right? Yes. And he has been engaging in this kind of emotional training for a long time. So how do we counter that? I'm very concerned about that. You know, how do we de defend these, not only defend them, but kind of, um, make a new offensive of compassion? Do we do it at the local level of community organizing, civic initiatives of education? Do we seed it into political candidates' messages? What mm -hmm. do you think is the best way to counter this? Well, if I, if I had an, an, an adequate answer to that, we'd, we could all go home and be happy. It's, a, it's extremely uh, tough. But what, what Trump's story illustrates is this point that I'm making about the confiscation of virtue, the ways in which, as you say, he turns the generous emotions, the, the ordinary virtues, into vices or into forms of foolish self-deception. And it highlights the extent to which all politics is like that, actually. It's important to grasp that. I mean, a liberal politics is fundamentally a politics of hopeful optimism that occasionally people can, you know, get to their better natures, as Lincoln famously said. And I don't think we, th we, we think of politics in extremely instrumental terms. You know, this program, that program, this fix to the healthcare system, that fix. But it's fundamentally a battle about who owns and defines social emotion. And, and, and we need to get in there. And very often, I, you know, I, I, I'm a spectacularly unsuccessful liberal politician. But I did learn that you couldn't win this battle by coming up with a really excellent six-point program. You had, to under, you, had to deep, you had to have much more emotional intelligence than I had. You had to listen carefully to what people were saying to you. And you have to come back and say, are you seriously telling me that every stranger you ever met is a snake? Come on, Donald, get serious here. As an observation, it's factually untrue. Yes, trust is sometimes mislaid, misplaced. Yes, sometimes uh, you give a bed to a stranger for a night and wake up and discover your wallet is gone. So what else is new, right? How about the times when uh, uh, generosity is repaid with more generosity? I mean, let me give you another example, a more pointed one. Um, Mr. Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, is engaged in a very passionate self-presentation as the defender of Christian values against the threat of Muslim immigration. Okay. You'd never know from the way he talks about Christianity, that there was ever a thing called the parable of the Good Samaritan. You would never know that Christianity is a language of mercy and compassion. The language of Christianity has been confiscated in such a way is that it's a marker of ethnic identity to the exclusion of everything else that Christianity ever stood for. 
And you have to get someone to stand up and say, are you seriously telling me this is the Christian faith? Let me quote some things to you, Mr. Orban, or whoever it is, and, and get into that battle. Um, One more. Uh, Stephen Luke's here. Yes, Michael, I, I've, I was puzzled by where you ended up about rights. Mm -hmm. You did seem to end up saying that rights talk is an obstacle in the face of the confiscation of ordinary values by populist rhetoric. Though you did also say that rights were very effective in the courts. So I'm wondering, I mean, are you basically saying that in politics, really rights, rights discourse is, a, mm -hmm. is something we should make do less of, even abandon? Uh, and I ask this in the context of um, uh, the argument of S uh, Sally Mary, the anthropologist, mm -hmm. who writes about human rights, yeah. who makes an argument almost the opposite of what you're saying. Namely, that the big problem is to render human rights vernacular, mm -hmm. to take them down to the level of the village and make human rights intelligible, yes. for example, when defending women who are being battered or whatever. Yes. That, I mean, that seems to me that to run in direct opposite of the, of the way you, you, you seem to be arguing. Well, I, I um, on, on the vernacularization point, it's very well taken. Um, I just think there are strict limits. I mean, human rights has gone global by going local. That part of what Sally Mary is saying seems to me right. But all I'm saying observationally, when I get into Favela Santa Marta and Zama Zama, I don't hear rights talk. I hear you can't treat me like garbage. I'm a somebody. My voice needs to be heard. But it'll be a long time before anybody tells you because I have a right to those things. And I just, I'm trying to do a kind of micro sociology here, observationally. And I don't disagree with Sally's normative claim that that's what we ought to be doing. We want to empower women in Santa Marta and Z Zama Zama to think I'm a rights bearer, I'm a woman. Um, there are claims that I can make, um, but the Zama Zama case is particularly painful because it ha South Africa has the best goddamn liberal constitution in the world. It's got rights, you know, you know, and and every liberal constitutionalist in every law school in the world teaches these kids that this is just the Maserati of rights constitutions. And all I can say is, when you get to Zama Zama, it doesn't exist. I wish it were otherwise, Stephen. I really do, but it, it just, you know, it, it doesn't. Now, on the, 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 the wider question, um, and, and this would be, again, a challenge to international human rights, is that what you see in the, in the, both in the British case, uh, in relation to Brexit and in relation to other things, and also in the American context, is that rights matter intensely. But it's not international human rights that matters. What matters is the constitutional rights tradition of the United States. And that matters hugely because it has democratic legitimacy. It has the, it has the whole 200-year history behind it. And so instantly, you know, within hours of, of uh, Trump's uh, uh, travel ban, you've got bright young lawyers going to, you know, the Fifth Circuit or the Seventh Circuit. I'm not a... Americans, so I don't understand any of this stuff, getting injunctions to stop it. That's rights effectiveness of a God bless them. But that's the stuff that's going to do it, frankly. And international human rights has been mostly a bystander. Now, I, I don't want that to be true either. I, I, I would like the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who's done very good work denouncing the Rohingya issue, the, the, the violations of the Rohingya case, speaking up for the Syrians, but uh, almost no effectivity at all, and let's just face it. In other words, 
constitutionally sovereign domestic rights regimes are as important as ever, even more important in a populist majoritarian temper. We need them more than ever. But I, at the moment, it seems to me, human rights is a, international human rights is a bystander on the story. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd like to be more obliging about it because I teach this stuff, believe in it, want it to flourish, but it's just, it's not where we are right now. And we believed a story that we would be going much farther, we did, and, and we haven't. And I'm now being told, because a sinister figure in a black <laughs> suit is standing beside me, that I have overstayed my welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I assure you there are no bystanders in this room. Um, all of that was performed uh, under the gaze of this man here. I think I saw him wink his approval. Very good. And you also, you made the walls part, which was really, was really amazing. So thanks to the generosity of Carnegie Corporation, we'd like to invite you to reception and also alert you to the fact there are books available for you. Um, so please take one. Michael, you may have to sign. Um, there's also Carnegie Reporter uh, magazines available with some articles in there. So thank you all. Please join us for reception. <laughs>